Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Make sure to hit the subscribe, like, and share buttons. Well, they're lying to you, and you need to be prepared for what's coming. So what am I talking about? We'll talk about that in just a second. First, I want to get to this. Uh, thank you to all of you who signed up to the Substack, End Times Bible Prophecy with Britt Gillette. That's at brittgillette.substack.com for those who haven't. One of the things that came up in the comments was, hey, Britt, it's asking me to pay. So I want to walk through this process very quickly just so that there's no confusion over what's going on. So if we if you go to brittgillette.substack.com, you're going to see this right here that says subscribe. Or if you want to go straight to the Substack and read everything that's on there, watch all the videos, you don't even have to subscribe to do any of that. Just hit no thanks, go through. All of that content is available free right now. What you want to do if you want to subscribe is subs subscribing will send email notifications to you so that if for some reason YouTube or any other big tech platform says, we're done with Brit, he's off, we'll have that direct connection. So if you enter your email here and hit subscribe, you're going to see this page. This is the default for Substack. Yes, there is. there are premium uh, signups where you can get access to commenting, uh, things in the archive, because after a month, these will go into an archive behind a paywall, but none of that is necessary to receive this content. Just make sure you click over here on the right-hand side, free, continue without paying, and when you do that, there's maybe a couple other screens where they ask your preferences, and then you're done. You're taken here. You'll be notified of everything that comes up on the Substack. We'll always have that direct connection. You'll be able to explore everything that's on there for not just these videos and getting notifications of these videos, but there's going to be written articles and content that appear on this in the very near future. You'll have access to things like notes, which is just whatever I'm thinking about at the time, what am I reading, what videos do I see, what's going on. You'll have access to all of these interviews that I've done in the past on other channels. So there's a lot there to check out. So make sure that you head to brittgillette.substack.com and do that. Okay, so they're lying to you and you need to be prepared. Well, who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about well, the government, <laughs> but the, the central bankers in particular, and anyone in government that's intertwined with them. One of the questions that came up in a comment last week, I think it was, or earlier in the week, was asking, Britt, will you address bail-ins and credit unions? So we're going to talk about those things today. But we need to first set the context for what's happening because have no doubt about it, they're lying to you and they will lie to you in the future when things take place. How can I make such a claim? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at this. So this is from ABC News. It is from March of 2023, as you can see right here. Oops, let me turn this off. And of course, they want to play their, their stuff and <laughs> mess up the audio. But anyway, it says Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifies banking system is sound. So this is from March 16th, 2023, in the middle of the Silicon Valley bank crisis where, remember, we had the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in the history of the United States, even accounting for inflation. If these bank failures had taken place back in 2008, they would have been the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history. So again, this is from last year. It says, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told Congress on Thursday the U.S. banking system is sound after two bank failures stirred economic fears. Yellen, who testified before the Senate Finance Committee about President Joe Biden's proposed budget, began her remarks by addressing 
the abrupt collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in California and Signature Bank in New York. Quote, I can reassure the members of the committee that our banking system remains sound and that Americans can feel confident that their deposits will be there when they need them, she said. This week's actions demonstrate our resolute commitment to ensure depositors' savings remain safe. Right? Okay, that sounds great. Fast forward, well, not even a year, because we have this article from CNN Business, which is from uh, February, where it says, well, Janet Yellen, some banks might be quite stressed by empty office building trouble. Okay, maybe things have changed, but... Let's listen to what's said in this article. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen detailed on Tuesday the scramble by U.S. officials last March to prevent the implosion of Silicon Valley Bank from infecting the broader economy. Quote, I'll never forget, Yellen told lawmakers during a hearing before the House Financial Services Committee referring to the weekend after Silicon Valley Bank failed. Quote, We did everything we could to put together a package of measures that would stop what could have become a run on the banking system to the huge detriment of our economy and hardworking Americans and businesses. (laughs) So here she's testifying this year. Oh, yeah, the whole thing was about to fall apart. We were going to have bank runs and it was going to infect the global economy. This was terrible. And last year she was saying... The banking system is sound. (laughs) I can reassure members that our banking system remains sound. All while this was going on, all while she now tells us, oh yeah, we were scrambling behind the scenes. I'll never forget it. We did everything we could (laughs) to prevent this from happening. Guys, they, Exhibit A, they will lie to you. They did lie to you. She lied to us a year ago, saying the banking system was sound, when behind the scenes, she and others are scrambling around trying to figure out how are we going to patch this thing up to keep uh, the whole thing from collapsing. So, fast forward to today. Where do we stand? Well, here we have the latest report from the FDIC. They finally updated this chart on unrealized losses at banks. And hey, good news. It's they're only, they only have half a trillion dollars in unrealized losses. That's an improvement. Well, as of the end of the fourth quarter, let's put it that way. As of the end of the fourth quarter, U.S. banks are sitting on half a trillion dollars of unrealized losses. That's an improvement over the three quarters of a trillion dollars of un- unrealized losses they were sitting on at the end of the third quarter. So this is good news, right? Right? Of course, you know, we don't have the data for right now, but let's look again. These are based on generally uh, U.S. Treasury debt that they bought. And when interest rates went up, the value of those that debt went down. So that's the unrealized losses for the most part that we're looking at here. We're also talking about mortgages as well. Mortgages, they made it 2% and 3%. And now those rates are at 6%, 7% and they're sitting on unrealized losses. But let's look over here at CNBC. This is the 10-year treasury, which now is at 4.22%. Back at the time of the Silicon Valley crisis, it hit a peak of 4.09. So we're higher today than we were then. And of course, it, in between now and then, we had this peak up here of almost 5%. If you remember, at that time, we started seeing, well, um, there's a glitch in the banking system. There's some glitches in some Japanese banks, and there's some glitches with Wells Fargo and Bank of America and JP Morgan, and there's some ransomware attacks and some problems with the treasury market, and a guy had to take a thumb drive and run across the street in New York City to keep the whole thing from collapsing. But it was all just, uh, you know, a cyber attack, a ransomware attack, a software glitch, right? (laughs) All all of these excuses they made for it. And then, of course, as the interest rate fell, maybe that helped 
with some of these unrealized losses and push some of these banking problems back. But we also saw at that time the bank term funding program start to go up. So let's take a look at that. We've been talking about that. That's the program that they put in place to keep uh, everything from falling apart. Last year, when Janet Yellen was scrambling to keep everything from falling apart, yet telling us the banking system is sound. And so here we are at mid-October. When we, when we started to see those rates go up, we pointed out, hey, they're starting to use this again, <laughs> right? And then we also noted recently that all of this this, these are loans for one year. So basically, this program says, hey, you've got something that it's got a face value of $100, but now it's worth $70, right? You can loan it to us and we'll give you the full $100 and you pay us, you know, 4% interest or whatever. And one year later, when all this crisis is passed, uh, you know, you just pay us back and we're good to go. So we're at a point now where they're having to pay these back because these initial loans took place in mid-March until early April. So $79 billion was loaned to these banks by April 5th of 2023. So that means within two weeks from now, $79 billion will have to be paid back. And as you can see here in the past week of data, so from a week ago Wednesday to this Wednesday, $17 billion was paid back. That's going to be up to $79 billion in two weeks from now. What does that do to the banks, as we talked about, that are sitting on half a trillion dollars in unrealized losses that were about, everything was about to fall apart. Uh, Janet Yellen told us there they were about to be bank runs and this was about to spread into uh, the rest of the economy. So, you know, now this is unwinding. And as we saw, rates are higher now than they were at the time of the crisis. So what does this mean going forward? It means we're going to see another banking crisis in the near future. Is it going to be exactly two weeks from now? I don't know, but we're getting very close to it because, again, all of this has to be paid back. Now, when that happens, what are they going to tell you? <laughs> because remember, last year, Janet Yellen said, oh, everything's sound. Banking system is sound. We don't have to guess what they're going to tell us because there was a meeting in late 2022 it was called the Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee Advisory Meeting for the FDIC. So for those who are outside of the United States, this is Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. This in the United States is what backs up uh, banking deposits at all the banking institutions so that up to $250,000 in cash deposits are insured and backstopped by this organization, by the federal government. And so I thought, well, let's go back and look at what they said again, because we did a video on this at the time, all before Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and First Republic failed and said, uh, watch what they're saying here. They're preparing for something, right? Because that's what happens when they do these war games. So I said, well, let's go back and look at those clips. And what happened when I clicked on it? Oh, <laughs> service denied. Oh, there's a login error, right? It's like, it's another, it's another software glitch. We'd love to show you that archival footage, but uh, we can't because, you know, there's a glitch, right? But fortunately, <laughs> right? Fortunately, although it was time consuming, I had the previous video and went back and clipped those clips out. So if you bear with me, I'll mute my microphone and we'll look at some of those clips and talk about what they were saying, what they're, because this is a behind the scenes look at when the crisis hits, what are they going to do? They're telling us 
flat out, and they're counting on, well, nobody's going to watch this boring meeting. And then other people do, <laughs> right? People like me said, watch the whole boring meeting, three all three hours of it, and said, you might want to pay attention to this. And so they said, uh, let's make it a glitch so that this isn't... Well, We'll put it on the website and claim that it's publicly available, but we'll just make sure nobody can access it. But fortunately, we had those clips, so let's take a look at those now. So here's the first of these right here. I'm going to mute my mic and we'll listen to what they have to say. Hi. Um, as Betsy conveyed, we've done a lot about transparency in terms of resolution planning. It's all out there on the website. What we want to think about and what we're starting to work on now is how to improve transparency about our execution plans for, for Title II resolution. Uh, we've been working on these for 10 years now, and uh, we should probably be start, starting to say more things uh, publicly. So what do we want to think about today is what should we be transparent about now? that would help uh, improve confidence in the event that we're called to use our, our Title II uh, authorities. And we've been thinking about this across you know, many dimensions. Uh, first, we look at who we need to be transparent for. Um, and we have a, a large number of lists on this slide that you can see. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work with uh, policymakers and regulators around the world, it's been said, and a lot of engagement with firm, certain parts of the firm. Um, so the sides on the right, we've probably done more on, but what do we need to be thinking about for the stakeholders, um, um, the general public, customers, counterparties, other people like that? We think about what, what message do these, these stakeholders need to hear, um, and it might not all be the same. Um, and then we think about when we need to be transparent. And I know that there's going to be a temptation for us to say, for people to say, FDIC should just lay it all out there. Say what you're going to do every step along the way, and, and that pre-commitment will help improve confidence. But we also need to be mindful of the need for FDIC to have operational flexibility to adjust to the specific facts and circumstances on the ground. <laughs> so, so there you have it. They've told us right out, out loud, oh, there's going to be, uh, we want to have transparency. We definitely want to have some transparency, but we've got to be, uh, we need we need to know who to be transparent to and when to be transparent. Because, you know, some people say we should just lay it all out on the line and say, say what we're going to do. But, uh, you know, we need operational flexibility. We, so, you know, we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll have, we'll have transparency for, uh, uh political insiders in Washington, and we'll have transparency for uh, the bankers on Wall Street, and we'll have uh, our, our message and our transparency for regulators, and then we'll have our transparency for the public, right? And let me tell you right now what that's going to be. It's going to be the banking system is sound, right? <laughs> and, it, it, and they may even add and resilient to the end. <laughs> They'll go, the banking system is sound and resilient. So they're telling you they're going to be transparent, but they're going to have different, different levels of transparency depending on who you are, which means you and I are going to be lied to and insiders will get the truth. So that's, that's what they're telling us flat out. So let's take a look at the next clip. All right, here we go. Let's look at this next clip. There are a lot of things we've been thinking about, and what we want to hear from you today is what your what you think would the priorities would be in order to go about setting expectations appropriately in public about how we would execute Title II, so that if and when we do have to have that announcement on on Friday night, ideally Friday night, um, that people are in a position to receive it, understand it, and say, yeah, that works, um, and we can see how this will happen. Of course, there will be doubters, but there's a lot of things going on. So did you catch that? If you've been watching this channel for a while, we've mentioned when all of this happens, <laughs> when the credit event happens, when uh, the problems take place, it'll be on a Friday. And here she outright says, uh, preferably on a Friday, ha ha ha, because, you know, I mean, just look at the body language there. 
It's like, hmm, yeah, yeah, we're going to pull one over on them. It's going to be on a Friday because we need the weekend to get ready. So they're making it clear what the plans are, what they're going to do, <laughs> what they're going to say to you and me. So, but this, this goes on. I got a couple more clips that we're going to want to look at. So let me pull those up now. All right, so here's the next one. Let me mute my microphone and then we'll go. First of all, I'd like to uh, praise the FDIC for its unrelenting pressures to have more disclosure under the, the actual public reports. I think they have been very helpful. Uh, second, I guess I am a bit pessimistic about your ability to communicate with the people who really need to know in terms of a crisis. And this is partly from my experience of teaching this stuff. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of interest um, just after the crisis. It's dwindled over time. And so people are sort of less and less interested in getting into the nitty gritty and some of the really interesting uh, developments. So I would think your strategy ought to be to disclose as much as possible to people who professionally need to know about it. And that would I, certainly include the ratings agencies and the people within the banks who are responsible for these uh, judgments. Um, and simply have publicly available a place where people can go if they, they need to know more. Because we're dealing with a society where people are getting their information in tweets. There's just no patience, I think, for going through the elaborate and careful planning that has gone on. It should be there. It should be accessible when people need to know. But I don't think you have much hope <laughs> of, of reaching a public that doesn't have a professional need to know. So there you go, guys. Did you notice the notice again the body language? There's a smirk on his face. And the smirk on his face, the smirk on the faces of the people in that room is because they're thinking of us when they're talking about these things. Well, I don't think there's much hope that these people are going to figure this out. You know, it, they're, well, if we tell them the truth, they're going to they're going to draw the wrong conclusions. They just don't understand how all of this works like we do. They, they, they get their news from tweets and sound bites, and they just don't understand all the sophisticated inner workings of the banking system the way we do, right? What they really mean is they're afraid that people will understand the truth very clearly and that they understood what the banking system is really like, there'd be a massive bank run tomorrow. That's what they're afraid of. And notice how he says it should be limited to ratings agencies, you know, all of these politically connected insiders, Wall Street, Washington, all of us in this room, because we all are part of that elite class, we understand. People who have a need to know, as if this is classified information, and when you have a classified information, you say, well, even if you've got a security clearance, you have to have a need to know. They're putting this on the level with that, the banking system. So, you know, it's your cash in the bank, but you don't have a need to know. Only the people on Wall Street, the politically connected, they have a need to know. And guys, you're going you're gonna to shake your head at this next clip because this one sums up that thought process in total and it's another exhibit of what they're going to do how they're going to lie when all of this breaks down so let me pull up this next clip right now all right so here's this next one let me mute my microphone and then we'll play i completely agree with that i almost think you'd scare the public if you put this out like why are they telling me this should i be concerned about my bank like my insurance company doesn't tell me what they're doing with my assets. If they just assume they're going to pay my claim, right? It's, it's, I think you've got to think of the unintended consequences of taking a public that has more full faith and confidence in the banking system than maybe people in this room do, <laughs> that we want them to have full faith and confidence in the banking system. They know the FDIC insurance is there. They know it works. They put their money in. They're going to get their money out. So there, there's a select crowd of people that are in the institutional side 
And if they want to understand this, they're going to find a way to understand this. There's a bunch of law firms represented in this room. There's a bunch of people that charge them by the hour a lot of money to explain this all to them. And, and, and it's fine. And I, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. And they all have huge staffs. But I would be careful about the unintended consequences of starting to blast too much of this out in the general public. <laughs> I'm almost, I'm almost speechless. But again, notice the, the body language, the smirking, the laughing, the general public. You know, they, they have a whole lot more faith in the banking system than you and I do in this room. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, none of us have any faith in the banking system, but we can't have the public not having faith in the banking system because then the whole charade falls apart. So we've got to make sure that, you know, again, the elite, the insiders, we all know, you know, there's the people who need to know, sort they know already because they got teams of lawyers and accountants and, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to offend them because they, you know, they all are in charge of me. They own me. That's that's the translation of what he just said. And and so we want to keep people thinking the banking system is sound, right? <laughs> The next crisis, the banking system is sound. Exactly what Janet Yellen told us before, a year ago. And then later she goes, oh, yeah, it really wasn't. There were going to be bank runs. The probably would have spread throughout the economy and maybe even destroyed the global economy. But whew, we got through it. We told the public the banking system is sound and they believed it. Just like they believe their insurance company is going to pay them in the event of a loss. Right? <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what he's saying there. So let's look at what all of this means. What are they talking about? Because one of the things that came up in that uh, a question last week was, can you talk about bail-ins and credit unions? So we're going to talk about bail-ins. Because that's essentially what they're talking about here when they're mentioning, you might have heard Title II mentioned in there, they're referring to the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed following the great financial crisis in order to handle these types of problems in the future. Because needless to say, people were pretty angry that all the big banks, all of these Wall Street insiders got bailed out at taxpayer expense. None of them went to jail. Nothing happened. Now they're back to doing the same things that they were doing before. You and I paid the price for all of that to bail them out. So they said, well, we're going to make sure that they don't get those bailouts in the future. So we're going to create bail-ins. <laughs> well, what? What is a bail-in? What may happen if your bank fails? So this is from Fortune. It says, forget bailouts. Here's how a bank bail-in works. And this is from last year. So this is right in the midst of when people were asking these questions, which, guys, the time to ask these questions is before the crisis, not in the middle of it. <laughs> That's like going out to buy fire insurance when your house is in flames, right? You want to know these things ahead of time so that you can protect yourself. It says, the recent collapses of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank have done much more than inject uncertainty into public discourse about the banking sector. They've also sparked fear about bank solvency and political outrage over the potential for more bailouts. An emerging but little understood bank failure remedy called a bail-in has brought more confusion to the conversation. Let's unpack bail-ins, what they do, who they affect, and what you need to know to protect your assets if a bail-in comes to your bank. What is a bail-in? So a bail-in is a form of financial relief for banks, right? Not for you. <laughs> right? Let's keep that in mind. It's for banks that are in danger of collapsing or going bankrupt. The relief comes from canceling some or all of the bank's debt by reducing the value of bank shares, bonds, and uninsured deposits. There's your bail-in. It says, note, the FDIC insures most bank deposits up to $250,000 per individual. So when they say uninsured deposits, they're talking about deposits above $250,000. And we'll talk about 
you know, why that matters. You may say, well, I don't have $250,000 in the bank, so I have nothing to worry about. But keep in mind, you, if you have a job or someone you love has a job, most likely the payroll for the company they work for is more than $250,000. So if that bank fails and it's bailed in using the company's payroll deposits, well, now you don't receive a paycheck and your company is out of business, which is exactly why they didn't do this with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, because as Janet Yellen said, there would have been bank runs everywhere because companies would have lost. There was one company that had a billion dollars in a checking account, a billion dollars, some venture capital firm. And, and they should be penalized for doing that. They should have to pay the price for doing that. But again, <laughs> let's, let's read on and see what else it says. It says a bail-in is the opposite of a bailout. Well, not really. It's just another form of a bailout, if you ask me. Instead of relief funds coming from outside taxpayers, the funds come from inside. <laughs> shareholders and depositors. So aren't the shareholders and depositors taxpayers? Aren't they one and the same? <laughs> Anyway, it says, although bail-in relief has been implemented in Europe, it's never been used in the United States. Even so, bail-in relief was legalized in the U.S. with the passage of the 2010 Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, following the financial crisis in which banks deemed too big to fail were bailed out by the U.S. government. The specific section of Dodd-Frank that deals with bail-ins is Title II. That's what they were talking about in these videos, orderly liquidation authority. So we can't, can't send these messages out to the public. They can't handle it. They get all their news from tweets, right? <laughs> so we got, got to have a message to tell them because we don't want them knowing about this. To prevent mass bailouts in the future, orderly liquidation authority restricts some of the riskier asset activities banks have engaged in previously. Uh, like what? They're still, they're still doing all the same things they were doing before. Uh, increases government oversight of banking activities. Okay, how? Not really sure how, how that is. Forces banks to maintain larger cash reserves. Really, because as you recall, we find this on the Federal Reserve website. Reserve requirements, as announced on March 15th, 2020, the board reduced reserve requirement ratios to 0% effective March 26, 2020. This action eliminated reserve requirements for all depository institutions. So these larger cash reserves, reserve requirements, I guess they were negative before? I'm not trying to... <laughs> Now they're saying that creates a process bail-in to liquidate failing financial institutions without a bailout. So and then it goes on to talk a little bit more about about this. But guys, we need we need to understand this because you don't want to understand this in the middle of a crisis. So this section says, how does a bail-in work? It says bail-ins, which cancel a bank's debt owed to creditors and depositors, serve as an alternative to bailout. So aren't you happy, right? <laughs> the taxpayers won't have to bail out these failing banks uh, unless you're a depositor in one of those failing banks. And then, ish, you know, <laughs> probably you would hope for the bailout in Washington again. But it says here, quote, in my view, a bail-in appropriately forces investors to take risk before depositors who do not do the same level of investigation on their financial institution when placing their funds in the bank, says Gregory Garcia, chief operating officer of First Commerce Bank. And then it goes on to say how a bail-in can take place. It's a two-part test by the Treasury Secretary. And of course, they went through this last year and determined, uh, we're just going to create programs out of thin air and we're going to do everything we can to bail everybody out because if not, we'll have a run on the banks. But here it says, and, and this is important to grasp, it says under Dodd-Frank as a receiver, the FDIC would have three to five years to liquidate the bank and remember that. 
and ensure that shareholders and unsecured creditors bear the loss of the failed bank. Uninsured creditors, guys, includes depositors. When you deposit your cash at the bank, you're an uninsured creditor. Now, the FDIC comes in and says, we will guarantee up to $250,000 in deposits. So if you have less than $250,000 cash in one of these institutions and it fails, you have a promise from the government to make you whole. And I believe that promise will be kept. No politician would renege on that. The problem is, what, what's the purchasing power of that cash? And then there's another problem, which is, you know, they say, <laughs> well, well, we'll look at this in a second, but it says, They'll have three to five years to liquidate the bank and remove bank management responsible for the failure. Okay, that's reasonable. Make payouts to claimants that are at least equal to the amount that would have been received under bankruptcy. That's reasonable. Cover FDIC insurance liability to qualified depositors up to $250,000. Wait, what? So they have three to five years under the law to do that? <laughs> right. So... So yeah, you'll get your $250,000 back, but it might be three to five years. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee that it'll be three to five years. And so recent cases of that, maybe it's been a week, maybe even a day. They turn around, they close everything, close up shop on Friday, and then on Monday, uh, FDIC insured depositors get their cash back on Monday. That's happened. But in a major crisis, if they can't do that, well, then they're going to tell you the same thing that George Bailey told everybody when they were coming in the Bailey Brothers Savings and Loan Wall. Well, you signed on the dotted line saying you had 90, 90 days. You know, you, you, you know, sign here and we'll get you your cash in 90 days. Well, they're going to say, hey, you, we told you it'd be three to five years. You'll, you know, you'll get your... You'll get your cash back, but it'll be three to five years. <laughs> so this goes on to talk a little bit more about some of the history of these bail-ins. You know, this has never happened in the U.S., but it's happened abroad. It happened in Cyprus, so you can read about that if you want to find this article. And then it says here, are bail-ins legal in the U.S.? You know, we just talked about, yes. It says, yes, technically bail-ins have replaced bailouts for two big to fail banks under Dodd Frank. It's important to note, however, that no bail ins have occurred in the US so far. Right? <laughs> and that make, makes me think of that internet meme with Bart Simpson and Homer Simpson, where it's like they say, no bail ins have happened in the United States so far. Right? So far, it hasn't happened so far. In fact, the recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank resulted in a systemic risk exception. So all Silicon Valley Bank and Signature depositors would be made whole. So in other words, they bailed them out. So they, they, they put into process this law that said, uh, no more bailouts. And then they went, oh, wait, we're going to bail them out, right? <laughs> so, so you might go, well, why should I worry about bail-ins when they just had a need for a bail-in last year, but they bailed everybody out? And the reason you need to is if you remember at that time, Senator from Oklahoma, when he was talking to Janet Yellen, he said, now, the Silicon Valley Bank had all these politically connected people, all these venture capitalists and people in Silicon Valley had cash there. He bailed them out. If a regional bank in Oklahoma fails. Are you going to bail them out? And Janet Yellen said, well, we'll see. Right? She said, said I'll consult uh, with Jerome Powell and the President of the United States. You know, we'll go through our checklist. We'll see if there's any big... She didn't say this, but she, she said up to that much. But then she said, I'm, I'm sure what was implied was, we'll see if there's any uh, big political donors who have deposits at that bank. We'll see, uh, you know, if there's any politically connected people that need to be bailed out. And if there's not, then nope, your bank's going to fail. That bank's going to fail, and meaning it will be bailed in. So at some point, this is coming. They've made that very clear, guys, <laughs> that that's what they're talking about. And when it does come, 
when we see this stress in the banking system reemerge, we see the banking crisis reemerge, know that they are going to lie to you just as they lied to you last year, just as they had a committee meeting where they sat around saying, we're going to lie to you. We're going to lie to different people in different ways. We've got to figure out who we're going to be transparent to and who we're not going to be transparent to. And smirking the whole time because they know it's absurd to claim that it's transparency when you're, <laughs> when, when you're trying to figure out who do we need to be transparent to and not. You know? <laughs> they know, they know how absurd that is and that that's not transparency. So they're going to be lying to you. And so, guys, that time is coming, as we heard them say, on a Friday. Don't know when this is going to come, but there will come a day on a Friday where we see this. We see a bank holiday. So, as we've noted before, they had a bank holiday in March 1933 in the depths of the Great Depression to stop runs on the banking system. All the banks shut down while they tried to work through the process of making the, the whole system stable again and functional again. The same thing is likely to happen in our day and time. And when that happens, credit markets will freeze. And that's a big deal because as the engine of the global economy runs on energy, like oil and electricity, so the financial system runs on credit. And if credit disappears, everything comes to a grinding halt, which means the distributor that brings gasoline to the local gas station won't be making those runs. The distributor that brings food to the grocery store will not be making those deliveries. And so in a few short days, your grocery store will be empty, the local gas station won't have any gasoline. Again, this won't be a permanent thing. It could be a few days, could be two or three weeks, but you need to be prepared for that. And as we just read, what if your bank fails? Well, if, you, if you're under the FDIC limit, I'm confident you will be paid back. The question is, when? What will be the purchasing power of that cash? So when will you get paid back? Is it going to be three to five years? Well, under law, it could be. It's probably not going to be that long, but what if it's a month? What if you can't, if you have one bank account and now you can't access it for a month, what sort of issues does that create? And so that, that brings up the question, the other part of that question, the comment was talk about credit unions or credit unions. Now, credit unions aren't FDIC insured. They have their own mechanism that's similar to FDIC with essentially the same rules. Credit unions probably as a whole, I would say, are safer because they are run by the members and for the benefit of the members of the union versus for profit. So they're generally not engaged in you know, trading derivatives <laughs> around the world like some of these big banks are. But there's there's no guarantee. You need to do your research. But I would say the most important thing to do, if you're trying to guard against this and you're tr trying to prepare against this, is to do what the Bible says right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. It says, send your grain across the seas, and in time profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risk lie ahead. Be diversified as much as you can. Some people have more, some people have less, but you don't, whatever you got, don't put it all in one place. You should probably have, if you can, an account at the bank, an account at a credit union, maybe at one or two banks, one or two credit unions, Maybe a big institution and a small ins small local institution. You should probably have so some cash somewhere where you can get access to it. And again, that's not going to be a safe deposit box because if there's a bank holiday, you aren't going to be able to access those until after the bank holiday. So maybe it's, as they did in the 1930s, a can buried in the backyard with cash in it. I don't know. You need to figure out what that means for you 
It means having a deep pantry. It means making sure that your vehicle is filled with gasoline every Friday. Today is a Friday. I'll have a full tank. We need to make sure we do those things because we don't know what risk might lie ahead, as the Bible tells us. And so we need to be prepared. Proverbs 27, 12 says a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. A simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. I've had a lot of other comments that I've seen from people saying, he's been saying this. Yeah, oh yeah, we need to prepare. This is, uh, you know, doom and gloom, dire stuff or whatever, clickbait, whatever you want to call it. But I just played the clips. We just looked at the article. Janet Yellen told us one thing a year ago. She told us another thing this year. The two were incompatible with one another. That's called lying. They had a whole committee meeting where they were basically getting together to say, how are we going to lie to the public when this happens? What's the story we're going to tell them? Yeah, we know we need to tell the real story to the insiders on Wall Street and in Washington, all of the politically connected, like those of us in this room who understand all of this, but the, the great masses who don't understand like we do, who don't have a need to know, what are we going to tell them? Well, we're going to tell them the banking system is sound and that it's resilient, right? That's what we're going to tell them. And then, of course, on the other side of all of this, what have we said is going to happen? I believe this crisis that's coming ahead, the financial crisis, the depression, is going to be the means by which they roll out central bank digital currency, which is something they've also been telling us they're going to roll out. And if you remember, <laughs> we've heard Christine Lagarde, head of the European Union, said, the digital euro is not going to be programmable. You know, don't listen to all these people that are saying that. They're all conspiracy theory theorists. It's not going to be programmable. And then, of course, they put out statements like this about their next phase of their digital project. And they say, uh, you know, it'll be widely accessible, free for basic use. It'll office, offer the highest level of privacy. Right, the highest level of privacy. This is not going to be programmable and used against people. That's what they're going to tell you. They're lying to you. They'll roll this out, and then later they'll say, Well, we didn't intend for it to be programmable. You know, well, I know we said that it was not going to be programmable when it got rolled out. We didn't intend to, but. There are all these people pushing misinformation on social media. And, you know, there's these protesters who are, are saying that, you know, protesting against the government, we can't have that. So we have to make it programmable so that we can cut those people off so that they can't spread this disinformation or make, you know, government officials feel uncomfortable because of the protests that are going on just like they did in Canada, if you remember the Canadian trucker protest. So guys, this we've seen how they've lied to us in the past. They're lying to you right now when they say the banking system is sound. They're going to be lying to you after it's abundantly clear to everyone that it's not and that it's falling apart. They'll continue to say it's sound and resilient. And then when they roll out central bank digital currency as the savior to the system, and say, this will fix the problem. They're going to lie to you and tell you it's not going to be programmable. And then a year later, they'll come out and say, oh, yep, yeah, it is. <laughs> and they may even say at that point, we intended for it to be all along. Because by then, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a trap. And once they lure the world into that trap, the door slams shut and there is no way out. And guys, this, while this is not the mark of the beast, central bank digital currency, it is indistinguishable in function from the mark of the beast and that no one will be able to buy or sell. The government will have that function, the ability to control that. So guys, we need to be uh, focused on this. You need to be aware of all this. You need to be preparing. As we said, have a deep pantry, fill up your tank with gasoline, be diversified. Because we don't know what risks lie ahead or 
what may happen. So just think through your mind, like what are the scenarios of what could happen? How can I best prepare for that? So guys, leave your comments below. I will do my best to read all of those comments. However, tonight is the NCAA tournament and my JMU Duke Dogs, James Madison University, that is my alma mater. <laughs> they are on TV tonight and I'm going to watch that and I'm going to take a break from all of this crazy stuff with the FDIC people, at least for a moment. They're taking on Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Badgers, so sorry all you Wisconsin Badgers fans out there, but I'm, I will be rooting for JMU regardless of who wins that game. Guys, the ultimate victory belongs to Jesus Christ, and that's why don't let any of the stuff that we've talked about bring you down. If your hope and faith is in Jesus Christ, well, you can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. So guys, make sure to leave your comments below, hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons, and God willing, I will see you on Monday.